Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations about art, literature, and creativity. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 116. Today's guest is David Naiman. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. So this week's episode is going to be a little bit different, a little something new, and I'm really excited about it. Today is our first ever KTCO book club discussion. So the way this is going to work is that from time to time, I'll be inviting a writer, critic, or friend of the show to pick a book, one that they didn't write, which we'll then read and then discuss here on the show. Now, I am, of course, still going to be hosting conversations with creative people about their own work. That's something I love doing and plan to keep doing as long as I'm able. But it's been my observation that you wind up having a different kind of conversation when you're talking to an artist about someone else's art rather than their own. And I think there's value in that. I think there are ways that we can broaden and deepen our conversations about art and literature, and that's why I'm adding this new episode format. I hope you enjoy it, and, you know, if you do, then I hope you'll chime in and let me know what's striking you about these new conversations. You can find me on Twitter at ChannelOpenPod or by email at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com. So for this inaugural book club episode, my guest is writer and podcaster David Naiman. As I'm sure many of you already know, David Naiman is the host of the literary podcast Between the Covers, one of my favorite podcasts in any genre. He's also the co-author of Ursula K. Le Guin Conversations on Writing, and his writing has appeared in Tin House, Agni, Boulevard, Black Warrior Review, Orion Magazine, and Ziziva, among others. And the book that David has chosen for today's discussion is Teju Cole and Fazal Sheikh's hybrid photo prose book, Human Archipelago, published in 2019 by Steidel. The book combines photographs from Fazal Sheikh's archive of documentary portraits and landscapes over the past 25 years, which focus on displaced people and political refugees, with writing by Teju Cole, himself a noted photographer, novelist, and the former photography columnist for the New York Times. The result is a beautiful, often lyrical, and powerful meditation on national boundaries, coexistence, migration, imperialism, and what it means to be a human being. I've put a link in the show notes where you can purchase a copy of Human Archipelago from bookshop.org, and I do highly recommend getting one, especially because it wasn't made in a very big print run, so as time goes on, it'll be harder and harder to find a copy. But I think if you're able to get your hands on one, you'll agree that it's well worth it. Just a quick note before we get started with a book like this that's sort of part essay, part photo book. There aren't really going to be spoilers in the traditional sense, but David and I will be discussing the book in detail. So if you want to be able to experience it fully without influence, then it may make sense to pause the episode and come back to it after you've had time to read it yourself. Okay, let's get started. Here's my conversation with David Naiman about Teju Cole and Fazal Sheikh's book, Human Archipelago. So first of all, I just, thanks for uh, introducing me to this book. It was a real treat getting to read this. And, um, you know, I've heard of Teju Cole before. I was not familiar with uh, Fazal Sheikh's work previous, but I was really glad to to have this opportunity because I've been meaning to read more of Cole's work. Uh, but I wanted to start by first just asking you, what what was it about this book that made you pick this for our discussion? Well, that's a, that's a, um, a long answer, I think I have to that question. But I'll say that the first thing that jumped to mind was around the format of your podcast, because mm -hmm. Keep the Channel Open is both visual you you interviewing for often photographers and also writers but those worlds don't always meet so i know you've talked to me before about wondering how many people listening to your podcast are only listening to the literary episodes or only listening to the photography episodes and so part of what was interesting to me was to bring a book that was both image text a meeting of a writer and a meeting of a photographer, but also just sort of selfishly my curiosity and desire to learn your impression as a writer and a photographer yourself in ways that maybe I wouldn't be able to engage with the photography or where I would learn from 
both learn about photography or learn about you through your impression of the photography <laughs> um, by engaging with you with it. Because when I think about like some of your photography episodes, like um, the most recent one with Jessica Eaton, and that photography is super abstract. Mm -hmm. And then like Philip Ritterman seems more elemental and he sort of talks about trying to get beyond the apparatus of vision and then Jerry Takagawa's work with Japanese internment, super different than that, with both a political and a personal element. So I, when I look at those episodes of photography, I'm not sure that I can know what your particular angle on photography is. Because I don't see, at least as a naive listener around these episodes, I don't know what the connections are in you between those episodes necessarily. <laughs> There's not an aesthetic through line for me necessarily between those, which made me even more curious. I mean, I've listened to the episode where on the anniversary of your show where you talk about your own work too. So I guess I want to throw this back in your lap because I would be very curious about your thoughts about the images in, and then we maybe expanding out from those images. But how did Fossil Shakes images strike you in, in Human Archipelago? It's interesting, you know, when you talk about there being um, a through line or not, I'm not really sure that there is a through line necessarily to all of the, uh, the different photographers that I've talked to, or really even any of the, the writers for that matter. <laughs> it's all just sort of what I'm, whatever I'm finding interesting to think about, whether or not it has any necessary connection to the way that I work. And I, uh, one of the great pleasures of getting to do this show is that I get to talk to a lot of different artists and writers who work vastly different from the way that I do. Mm -hmm. And what is really interesting to me about this book is that a lot of my, um, I haven't done it in, in a little while, but like sort of a, a, an initial focus of my own photography practice sort of after my, not initial, but you know, as I was getting going was trying to figure out ways to marry image and text, which is a very, um, it's a surprisingly controversial thing in the photography world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so this book really does, I think a really great job of bringing those two things together in a way that is not exactly the same as how I do it. But it's not completely different either. In some ways, this this book is sort of closer to the way that I work than maybe almost anybody else that I've talked to working in photography. So that was a really interesting thing. But I mean, the thing that you just said was, you know, you wanted to sort of get my impression of the images. One of the things that I find really necessary in my own work, but also in this is that I, I'm not really sure that the images themselves can be taken separately from the text. They're, they're very, very tightly integrated. And to me, that is one of the things that makes the book so interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, um, I mean, one of, one of the things that's interesting to me too, is this isn't just, a. Uh, it would be interesting in and of itself if it was a, a collaboration between a writer and a photographer. But it is also a collaboration between a photographer and a writer who is also a notable photographer. And that, so Tidjo Cole is the writer in this book. He's not the photographer, but he was the photography columnist for the New York Times Magazine for many years. And he's also done his own book that is structured similarly to Human Archipelago, where he's done both the text and the image. So we have this collaboration where the writer can look at the images of Fazl Sheikh and look at them also as a photographer, not just as a writer. Yeah. Uh, and so there's this interesting doubling in it, I think, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things, you know, I mentioned that, that pairing image and text is a little bit controversial in the, in the photography world. A lot of photographers, less so in documentary and photojournalistic circles, but certainly in fine art circles and editorial and advertising and certain kinds of commercial photography, um, there is a real 
a, a very widespread opinion that if you need words, that it is a failure as an image. Mm. And there are some parts of this book that actually seem to be addressing that very head on mm -hmm. that I thought was interesting. Another thing that I thought was interesting too, is just, just to sort of like get a little context around the book is the book is published by Steidel, which I don't know if this is something that you are, are super familiar with, but Steidel is one of the premier photo book publishers in the world. It's probably sort of the gold standard for high quality photo books and like getting a book, a photo book published by Steidel is sort of like a huge feather in your cap for a, a photographer. Mm. It's a German publishing company. It's run by one guy. I mean, he, of course he has a, a whole company, but like the, the publisher's name is Gerhard Steidel and he personally oversees and, and works on every single book that they do. And then they only do about 300 books a year. Yeah. And I don't know how many sort of hybrid, like non straight photo books they do. So this just as sort of an exercise for the context of that publisher, this is also a kind of a, a pretty interesting book in that there is like a ton of text in it, which you, you really don't see very often in a photo book. And I think that that's something that really makes it stand out in the photography world. This is something that, you know, even in my books, which, uh, you know, our, our minor are, are, are handmade and they're, they're more artist books than sort of published photo books. But, you know, a comment I get a lot from reviewers and, and, and other artists is like, gosh, there's a lot of text in here. You're really asking a lot of the, the audience to That's have this much text in it. Yeah. But, you know, Cole seems to not be afraid of that, which I find really interesting. Yeah. Well, before we go farther into the form, I wonder if we should spend a couple minutes on what this project is about in terms of subject. Yeah, definitely. I think that would be a great idea. Because <laughs> a little bit of the backstory of, of Human Archipelago, as far as what I've read. So, I mean, Fazal Sheikh is a super famous uh, and well-regarded photographer with a long history of working on displaced people and migration. And that's also something that Teju Cole has written a lot about, about immigration, emigration, migration, displacement, erasure, home. And because I think a lot of the ways in which they take risks are really relevant to the, the a lot of the risks that they take in terms of the way that they frame things in this book are related to the subject matter. But also, it's just interesting to note that they reached out to each other because of this common theme that they're both working on. So this marriage of, of image and text is also a marriage of their interests in two different forms around the same subject. Yeah. And in, in Cole's uh, Times column, a lot of the the columns, like the one that, I, that introduced me to the column was one where he was comparing two images of India. One was by Steve McCurry and the other one I am ashamed to say, I can't remember the photographer's name, but he was talking about the sort of colonialist view of sort of National Geographic style photography of the other and how uh, this other photographer i'm gonna i'm gonna find this this column and link it in the show notes it's really it was really great um and it really opened me up a lot to understanding the sort of western gaze in photography mm -hmm. so that is something that cole has has written a lot about is how the sort of cultural context around the not just the photographer but also the audience and who who the photographs are being made for who are they of and who are they being presented to how that informs a lot of how the photographs are made and how we view other cultures and how we understand other cultures and that seems very relevant to the project of this book well let's stay with that idea of context because i think there's many ways you can read this book but i think there are two uh, very significant ways you can read it. And it feels to me like at least I needed to read it both ways. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear your thoughts on it. But when we see these images next to usually just a paragraph of text on the opposite side, we're not told what the images are of. And the text isn't necessarily telling us either. The text sometimes might be descriptive of what Teju Cole sees, but it might not be. It might be um, 
more oblique to the image or more abstract. But we don't know the the political, cultural, national, structural background to the people being portrayed or the landscape being portrayed if we just flip through the book without looking in the back. But the other way to do this book is each time you encounter one of these pages of image text is to go into the back and read the sources, which often is an entirely different experience. And so you're sort of holding, I think that's the point, but you're sort of holding two things at once. I just wondered, I was curious how that was for you as a reader, viewer. Did you like that? Was that frustrating? Because I know I'm reading some reviews that were frustrated to not have the context there, even as they realized that it would have been a challenge around the design and the aesthetic to have it there. And others that had some questions around framing around that. What were some of the implications of leaving some of that information out? You know, I think this is, um, this gets to a couple of things for me. And one is sort of more general and one is very specific to this particular book. A question that comes up a lot in photographic circles, because the photo book as sort of a career thing for all kinds of uh, photographers, whatever genre they're working in, it's a real, it's a, it's like a, a thing that, that everyone seems to be striving for. And there's always this question that comes up is why, why the book form? What is the book form doing for the work? And I think that there, that that is a really important question about like sort of the technology of the sort of book codex form. What that does in this book is really interesting, but on a more specific level, the book itself, you know, so the title human archipelago is referencing this idea that, um, and this is even quoted in the text of the book at one point, the, the whole idea of no man being an island, uh, whole unto himself, that we are, um, simultaneously part of a, a group, different kinds of groupings, community pairs, things like that, and also specific to ourselves. So the, the way that the book is working Everything is really aimed, in my opinion, this is my read on it, everything is very aimed at that idea, this idea of interconnectedness and of a sort of human unity that, you know, especially right now feels very salient and very profound. I had read some of those reviews that we're talking about this idea of the, the sort of minor complaints about the fact that in order to get context for the images, you have to flip to the end notes. To some degree, I think this is maybe missing the point of the book, but I think it is uh, th this way of different modes of approaching the book. In the past week, I've read this book three times. And the first time, not knowing anything about what it was about, I did find myself flipping back and forth to the end notes a lot. And not just for the, the images, but actually the text as well. When we talk mm -hmm. about context, the images are presented without context, without caption. And the only thing, the only text nearby is Cole's text, which is paired in some way or another. So if you want to know more about it, you have to, you get the captions in the end notes. But there's also a, a section of end notes, which is explaining the citations because many of the texts that are in the book are also quotations. They're not necessarily things that Cole has written himself. Some of it is, and some of it incorporates quotations or, or even not necessarily quotations, but just references other documents, other texts. And unless you are extremely well-read, you probably would miss that if you're just reading it straight through. The first time I read it, I was reading back and forth a lot. Like, this seems like a quote, where is this from? This, wh I wonder what this image is of. The second time through, I completely ignored the text and just looked at the images because I wanted to have the experience of seeing what this book was like if I tried to approach it as just a photo book, um, the way I would approach any other photo book. And that was a completely different experience. And then the third time, I read image and text together again, but without any reference at all to the end notes, just reading straight through in sequence. And what all three of those experiences were 
were very different from each other. And I found that my relationship with both the image and the text changed in each reading. And, and that was really fascinating. And I think a lot of it does have to do with this format of a codex book, you know, where we have this expectation that there is going to be a sequence of like a front to back linear experience. But because you can flip back and forth, you know, with your finger stuck in the page or whatever, that it, it's different from like if you were reading it on a scroll or if you were like reading it, like on scrolling down a website or something like that. So I, I, I think that that um, what that enables it was really, really interesting. But I also want to hear how how you read the book. And like, I assume you've probably read it more than once at this point. So like, yeah. did you also have different experiences with it? Well, I, I felt like. I guess to me, the friction between taking them, uh, quote unquote, out of context and then searching for the context, I felt like that tension is is the point of the book for me, or the discomfort and also the the productivity of of that tension. But like uh, before I speak to that, I guess I want to say one quick thing about the book as object because you'd you'd mentioned this the bookiness of the book because there was something in the New York Times review that they they really focus on how the book appears modest that unlike photography books its proportion is actually like a literary work it's it's about the size of a of a novel and the photos are about the size of what you'd expect for illustrations in a literary work. And the texts are really short. So you have this very modest book about a very overwhelming subject, you know, mass displacement, mass migration. You know, and migrations that Cole talks about in interviews are only going to be getting worse with climate change over the next century. And so it's, there's this tension also between the scope of the topic and the way the book is, is designed as a physical object. Mm. But then also the way they're troubling what a photography book would be, what our assumptions are around both the images standing alone and what words are standing alone when we find out that who we thought spoke the words are not, they're not spoken by the person we thought. But when I think about some of the things in the book and when you read them without context, because we have two, we have two, I would say, major categories for the photography. And one are, almost portraiture. We have uh, figures from various places who are often making eye contact and sitting in a well-lit situation, maybe even in a situation we'd expect for anybody but orphans and refugees. The, the whole setup of the photography is very much maybe someone who'd be you know paying a considerable amount of money to have their portrait taken. But that's not what that's not the subject of these portraits. And but then the other one are these very um distant landscapes. And we don't exactly know what we're looking at. And I think even one person mentioned that one of the photos looked of a landscape actually looked like a pockmarked door. But one of the things that happens with that, I think, is for instance, the section in the middle, which is a series of alternating faces. And if you close the book, it's as if the faces on either side of the page are, are kissing. And when I looked at those, I look at those and I would say sometimes, oh, these people look like maybe they're related. And when you read in the back, you learn that these are alternating pictures of Israelis and Palestinians. And not knowing that, I think you could if if that was the only thing happening in the book without the context, just this idea of giving sort of like this equal space and then this kissing of images, the idea of unity, I think, which I think they are striving for, this idea of unity, I think would be problematic because it would be erasing real dispossession that's happening and one narrative not being allowed to be spoken over another. And yet, there's this tension here, because I think there's this reach for seeing the humanity in both. And it makes me think, in that regard, it makes me think of, um, which I talked about in my conversation with him, but the Lebanese-American poet Phil Metris, 
whose last book is about Israel Palestine, and he was he was posting on Facebook on the anniversary of in Israeli Independence Day a poem by an Israeli poet, and he was saying, "This is a really he's a, he was imagining himself into the Jewish perspective on this day, but also saying at the end." Um, obviously, this was a day of catastrophe for Palestinians. And tomorrow, I will post for the Nakba, I will post a different perspective. And a lot of um, his Palestinian uh, friends and colleagues and peers, of which he has many, were troubled by putting them side by side. And his answer was, look at my work as a whole. And I like that answer, that he should be judged not on the post in isolation. Because if you were to look at those images in isolation, I think you could make a critique. But if you look at the book as a whole, the risk that they're taking to do what they do in the middle, I think is important, as long as we know also that a lot of these images we see, which are often beautiful and abstract, are also of Japanese internment camps are the ruins of a Palestinian village from 1947. But we don't know that when we're looking at them the first time. I know this is a long answer, but, um, but I feel like this tension around framing is a super important part of the project. It seems to me that when we are looking at any of these things, like you say, if this were just doing that and nothing else, that would lend itself to one interpretation, right? And it would be a very sort of facile kind of, oh, look, we're all the same under the skin kind of thing. And right. and that's a really easy thing to do. And it's a real sort of hallmark kind of um, sentiment. But so much of this book, um, whether it is in the text or in the images, is about complications, right? It's about, uh, and so much of it is about inviting this is an interesting thing i hadn't quite thought of this before but i like i i kind of wonder who the intended audience of the book is because so much of the book is inviting what would seem to be more of like a quote unquote first world kind of audience to put themselves in the shoes of people that they may not think about a lot to present these stories of migration and refugees and stuff like that in a very humanizing kind of way. And so looking at just those facing pages without that greater context is is sort of missing, I think, a lot of the thrust of the book. Like we are sort of entreated, I think, by the book to see people as uh, with a certain form of unity or or similarity or sameness. But to me, it seems like in the context of the entire book, that's really done, it's aimed more at the people who uh, would be more likely to not see refugees as people. Does that sort of make sense? Does that ring true to you? Yeah, no. Um, I'm just going to read a little paragraph from Sharon Mazota's review in the LA Times, which sort of echoes, I think, what you're saying. She says, in other less fraught political times, this ambition might have come across as pretentious. The appeal to a universal humanity would have seemed naive, or worse, reductive, reminiscent of Edward Steichen's much-criticized 1955 exhibition and book, The Family of Man. But in these times when basic human dignity is assaulted, in lethal and symbolic ways every day, it feels wholly necessary to return to first principles. And there's no way that, I, I guess, I mean, I would push back against this. I mean, maybe I'm agreeing with Sharon Mazzotta, but I don't sense a whiff of naivete in this book um, or reductivity. I, I think it is, it's a complex and sometimes very uneasy reading experience because of the the dissonance between first impressions and and then the impressions once you know and are oriented but i liked i like when fazel sheikh talked about his own doing of portraiture he calls it an act of mutual engagement and Tejakol had talked about how he'll go places, Fazl Sheikh will go places and spend an enormous amount of time there before he does even one portrait. And 
this is what Shake said about the act of mutual engagement. It's a mode that is in, in sync with my personality. It seems to me the most effective stance is to strip oneself back and allow a kind of space within which a subject of a photograph can confront me as a photographer and you as a viewer. It's a very simple approach, which is interested in the idea of openness and empowerment. And I guess that made me, I guess that's a long way around to say that I'm, I agree with you around the audience, because I feel like giving these subjects the dignity of portraiture and us meeting their eyes and, and our first encounter with them is these are fellow human beings that are interesting and uh, pique my curiosity. And, and then to find out that they are one of many of a given people that have, have likely been displaced in some fashion by actions of the first, the quote unquote first world. It's a pretty remarkable move to have both of those happening in the book. Yeah. I think it's kind of interesting that your um, the reference point that you made for the portraiture in this book, and, and these are images that in the photography world would be understand understood uncontroversially to just be portraits. That's just the word we would use in, in photo land. I actually wrote, wrote down some statistics about this book. There are 97 images and 56 of them are portraits. And of those 39 are looking directly at the camera, which is also an interesting thing because it is, you can take those as the subject of the portrait looking directly at the photographer, but also directly at the reader, which I think is, I think that's part of why they are what they are and why and how they function in this book. And also 30, 37 of the portraits are very close portraits with little to no background information or even body language. It's just really face and maybe shoulders. And only 12 of those portraits have more than one person in the frame. So it's really like very, most of the images in the book are very close. They're very focused on the face and the eyes. They're very focused on single people, which I thought was very interesting. The reference point that you gave before was commercial portraiture about someone paying money to have their portrait made. But the the reference point that jumped out to me at first was actually the uh, Farm Security Administration photos from the Great Depression. Uh, photographers like Walker Evans and Dorothea Lang, who these are doc social documentary pictures, but many of them are still made in a very portrait, classic portrait-like composition. And the idea of many of those sort of social documentary photographers that were in the 30s and 40s was very explicitly about humanizing. And th those were another type of migrant, right? Like the Dust Bowl migrants, people affected by the Great Depression, um, who in many cases, when they got to places like California were, you know, as we know from, say, the Grapes of Wrath, that um, people would talk about Okies and as though they were animals. And this is very similar to what the rhetoric around international migrants is now. So right. that's the reference point that really jumped out at me sort of stylistically and in context with sort of the message of the, um, the message of the book as a whole. Well, that's why I wanted to talk to you because my reaching to like commercial portraiture is mainly out of my own lack of knowledge around photographic history and lineage. So it's like, I, I reached out to that for not having anything else to reach out to. So it's really interesting and illuminating to have you put it in a context that, that makes a lot more sense than that. Yeah. I mean, even, um, more recently, you know, um, like one of the people that I have talked with on the show before is a photographer whose name is Brandon Thibodeau. And he uh, has a, it sounds like a somewhat similar working approach to what Fossil Shake, what you described about Fossil Shake, like going to an area and getting to know people before taking pictures, right? Um, and his work also is work that could be considered problematic in some ways. And, and that is something that I addressed a little bit in my conversation with him because he's a, a white man from Texas and his work that he's most known for are um, it, are photographs that are made 
of black communities, of people from black communities in the Mississippi Delta. And, you know, so there is this such a long history of this sort of colonialist approach to photography and especially documentary photography, sort of in the National Geographic tradition of photographers parachuting into place where they don't belong and where they don't really understand things and making very sort of exoticized and sensational and romanticized images of the people there and in order to present them to people, you know, basically to white people from Europe and America, right? Where what Thibodeau's work, uh, you know, many of which are portraits that are like you would expect, right, in, in a sort of classic portrait mode. Many of them are not also, but they are the result of him actually becoming a member of that community. There is still a, a, a remove there because he doesn't live there full time, but he, you know, is often revisiting the same families year after year after year and, you know, taking people's kids to school. And, you know, the portraits that he has made with some of these families are ones that, you know, at least according to the way he tells it, are they've become sort of treasured parts and mementos for these families. So there's this real sense of engagement there. Um, it doesn't, I don't think, completely erase the sort of problematic aspect of it, but it, it is something that is um, makes it more complex and nuanced. And it sounds like that's a similar thing here. This idea of taking people who you wouldn't normally, which we, th we think of portraiture going back, you know, even before photography as being something that is like, you know, wealthy people, lords and ladies kind of thing, right? Exactly. And, and this is a problematic way of putting it, but like the idea of elevating uh, sort of more of the people kind of subjects uh, and the idea that anybody needs to be elevated is a little problematic, but I don't think that's exactly what is happening here. But I think that there is sort of a way of, because especially the lay public has this understanding of portraiture and photography in that way, that even if it's not the intention behind the portraits, that at least some of the audience is going to receive it that way, you know? As elevation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, I think that's inevitably true, which I think is where the, the context at the back makes that more difficult to do, even if you do it without the context at first. But I also think perhaps Fazal Sheikh and Teju Cole, because they're not white, maybe that affords more, um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make a generalization that their experiences probably might increase the odds of a more nuanced approach. I mean, the fact that Teju Cole you know, grew up in Nigeria and then has lived in New York and Switzerland as a Nigerian American in New York City. And I'm thinking about like, I don't know if this is just going off on a tangent, but around this idea of, um, of what we see and nuance versus something very simplistic. But he has this recurring idea from his first book to his last, Teju Cole of The Blind Spot. And it predates him him losing his own, temporarily losing, losing his own vision. So it's this sort of uncanny interest that he had that predates a, a medical condition he had at one point. But the way the way that I read Open City, one of the ways I read Open City, his book that I think is one of the great New York novels, but also one of the great novels about America. And also, I think one of the ways in, in which I've best seen intersectionality narrativized, because this, this protagonist who is, I believe he's a Nigerian German immigrant to New York City, when he walks around the city, because of his ancestry and his personal experience of migration, what he sees in foregrounds, what he elevates are things that a white American moving to New York might not notice or see. So he he talks about the African burial grounds. He has a conversation with a Haitian shoe shiner about slavery in Haiti. He has this long conversation with a uh, a teacher of his around, a Japanese teacher of his around internment, and many more things. But the real, the, the most discussed thing in that book 
is this very risky move he does at the end, which I think sort of reveals the blind spot of the narrator. So we're like completely enmeshed with this narrator's voice. And then in the realm of gender, he can't see his own privilege or the ways in which he moves around in the world as a man is causing harm. And we lose rapport with him very late in that narrative. It's a risk that he takes to show us the incapacity of this character to see something about himself. But it's also, as he writes elsewhere, part of the structure of actually the eye itself, that if our mind wasn't constructing the full image for us, we'd have this like black, I I don't remember how large it would be, but this sort of black spot in our vision. And I wonder, I guess, about all of these different things in the book, the really distant landscape, almost abstract photography, and these really close in intimate faces, and then juxtaposing this with words, not always knowing the source of the words, and then being jarred out of where we thought we were when we read the stuff at the back. If these are all strategies, if we're thinking of the first world as the audience in this framing around intersectionality, if these are all strategies to jolt us out of seeing it as elevation, Hmm. this fear that you had around, we're going to see it giving voice to the voiceless rather than they already have voices and they aren't being listened to. I don't know where I'm going, but I, I, I'm just wondering if some of these strategies are part of um, making it hard to have that be your only response to the portraits. Well, I think that they are, they are doing something like that. But I think one of the things that's really makes this very challenging is the nature of photography itself. And this is actually something that Cole has talked about in his columns previously. Like a lot of his work has to do with the we- the Western gaze and what that how how our understandings of, of photography are often invisible to ourselves because we are so used to thinking of photography as reality. So one thing that I found really interesting about this book is, you know, speaking about audience, is that there are parts of the book, like throughout the book, running throughout the book, there are these times in the text where Cole seems to be trying to educate the uh, the reader into how to read photographs, like how to understand visual language. And a lot of these things are, it's not that they're, there's nothing um, trite about it, like even for someone who is familiar with these ideas, but they're not new ideas to someone who spends a lot of time thinking about photography. Whereas, so the fact that he's putting them in there in this way, like this is how you read um, a photo book. Like, you know, there's one section where he's talking about, you know, an individual image is like this, but if you have images in series, then they can do this. And it's more like each image is a sentence or a paragraph. That's an idea that in the photo world is just very well understood already. And you wouldn't need to explain that if you were expecting that your audience, your readers were really, really uh, familiar with the, the sort of conventions and tropes of a photo book. Similarly, there's one spread that comes sort of, I think about two thirds of the way through the book where the, on the, on the right hand side, the photograph is of a hand holding a photograph. And then on the left hand side, it says, um, something to the effect that, um, a photograph of a face is not a face. And so again, like it's trying to tease apart this sort of ontological difference between photography and reality. And I think that is in service of this idea of the blind spot, right? But where in fiction, what you describe of this character being unable to see his own privilege in this one way, that's something that because there's sort of a a, a greater level of remove between the reader and what's being represented in the text, then between a, a viewer and a photograph, it's that is there in the photograph also. And it is there in these photographs but it's harder to separate, I think, for most, especially for sort of a casual um, photography audience, hard to separate those things. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a really weird phenomenon in the sense that, uh, so like when I've talked with, I've had two comics journalists on, so people who are journalists, 
storytellers and who, instead of being photojournalists, are are doing illustrations. But around so Molly Crabapple and Joe Sacco, who write about the trials at Guantanamo, who go to Palestine, and they talk a lot about the advantages of them being in journalistic settings, not taking photographs that they're drawing, which is sort of dismissed as being just um, a non-threatening because they it's seen as being subjective. So even though we know, if you do any reading about photography at all, that photography is subjective, I st- the weird part about it is that it seems to me like the reflexive response of most people still, regardless of how far we've advanced in an understanding around all the ways taking a photograph isn't passive, but a very active thing that involves a lot of choices and inevitably erasure, that's not how most people see it. Right. And not just taking the photograph, but also viewing the photograph is something that is very freighted with a lot of context on this part of the viewer. Um, and that is something that's that's very directly addressed in some of this stuff. So one of the things I wanted to sort of get at, there's sort of two things. Because one of the things I loved, 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 loved about this book is not just the fact that it marries image and text, but it is the way that it does it, right? There are several points in the book where Cole is kind of leading you to a certain interpretation of the image. And whether he's doing that by talking about something that is... You know, here's an image, like, for example, on page 60 and on page 114, uh, those spreads, there's a picture of a child at the right. And then at the text on the left makes a reference to some kind of heaviness in a child's face. On page 60, he writes, all children's faces are heavy with the future, but girls especially. And what we may guess of their uphill battle from time to time, you might see in a child, both her present and her future self already, she is careworn. And then on 114, it says, But what of when the child has seen more than a child should have seen, and already on the face of the child this too much seen can be seen? So in both of these cases, he's inviting you to, he's sort of leading you to a certain interpretation of the facing image. And this is sort of one of the more explicit ones, but this also happens where the way that the the mood of the text influences the way that you read the image. And one of the things that I was thinking about a lot was, The question is, if I'm looking at these pictures of these children's faces, and I'm now, having read this text, I am seeing a heaviness in their eyes or in, you know, the way that they have dirt on their face or something like that. If, if that's something that I'm seeing and reading the image that way, is that something that I would have seen on my own if I hadn't read the text? Having read the text, is the text leading me to something that is inherently in the image or is it putting the idea in my head and then I overlay that into my reading of the image? This actually applies to all of the image text pairings because there is in the text a certain mood or emotion or a sort of uh, mode of expression that leads you in a certain way as a reader. And that influences how you then you see and interpret the facing image. The thing that I sort of wonder about this is so this is something that just happens. So it may be that Cole and Sheikh are doing this in a way that they're trying to lead you to a certain interpretation. But it may also be that in addition to doing that, they're trying to get you to question that process of being led. And I do wonder if that's intentional, if that's, but I also, if that's the case, I think, you know, a lot, I think a lot of, a lot of reader viewers are maybe not going to catch that part. So I, I don't know, but I, I found that a really fascinating experience. Um, no, I, is- I think he is, I think he is trying to, um, point out that we're seeing a representation that we're viewing. I mean, we're also, we're viewing, I mean, that's the, going back to the very beginning, we're viewing the photographer's vision through another photographer's writing. So it's like our, our vision is filtered through two other people's visions and we're met with the vision of many of these photos being of, of eyes. I think that's true. I think that this sort of double filtering that we're getting 
is something that they're commenting on. I guess I just wonder if like you can't help but have like the the reading the text has an almost sort of subliminal um effect on you as you then parse the image and as you go back and forth between them because that operates in such a sort of subtle way i i wonder how many people would even realize that it's happening as they're doing it maybe that's not me not giving the reader enough credit <laughs> yeah i have yeah i don't know I want to read, I, I, inspired by you, I want to read a, a page also. So on page 54, there's an uncharacteristically large amount of text, two paragraphs. And uh, it's across from the page of a woman in a white headscarf who looks like she's either blind or has uh, cataracts. And this is what Tidja Cole wrote. In advanced age, the sealing off of the eyes is physiological. The body breaks down in many ways. The lungs are belabored, the legs struggle, the hands shake, and the hearing faculty becomes muffled. But we cannot resist a different reading when it comes to the eyes. We suspect that having seen too much over the course of a lifetime, they surrender themselves to darkness. Outer vision reaches its limit and the time comes for inner vision to take over. About a third of the way through the Odyssey, Homer springs a surprise when he suddenly introduces, at a banquet, an unnamed blind old poet. It's himself, in his own story. This blind poet sees deep into the story he is telling, which is the same story in which he is being told. It is not so much a metafiction as it is a moment of double vision. That almost feels to me like an uh, ars poetica for the book. Yeah, I think there's there are examples of this kind of thing that happened throughout the book of him either directly or more obliquely commenting on like or or, or leading you to understand photographs in perhaps a more sophisticated way, which I found really interesting. You know, the other thing too, this 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 example kind of gets at something for me too, which is just the nature of having um, images and text next to each other like this. One of the things I think a lot about in my own artistic practice is um, like, why do I want to have image and text? And it's, it's not really a good enough answer for me to just say, well, I am a writer and I am a photographer and I want to do something with both because it's like kind of putting the cart before the horse. So the question that I always have to ask myself is what does text do? What does the written word do well? And what does it not do well? And then what does a photograph do well? And what does it not do well? And why, how can these complement each other? I find that as I'm reading the text, much of the text, as you mentioned before, is sort of at an angle to the image. Um, some of it is more direct, but much of it is sort of at an angle. And it's often very lyrical. It's often sort of abstract, right? Like it's, it's not necessarily talking about even when he's talking about specific things specific people or or events there is a sort of high-mindedness to it i want to say or a sort of not generalization but like that he's talking about things that almost feel like philosophy right rather than um something very very concrete and what the images end up doing is the images always bring us back to something very concrete like you can't get more concrete than a photograph in, in, in a lot of ways, at least in one understanding of photography, the, the images make always bring you, because you, some of these think these text blocks, you could be talking about anything. You could be talking about any aspect of human experience, but the image always brings you back to like, no, I'm talking about something a lot more specific than just some general philosophical idea. And I thought that was very interesting. And similarly, the images because they're presented largely without context, it can be kind of hard to know what we're supposed to take away from it. The text gives it a different sort of emotional and philosophical context than you would have with the image alone. The thing that I note particularly is that, and this is something lots and lots of um, you know people have written about, is how the photograph can only give you a surface. It cannot give you any kind of interiority. If it gives you any interiority at all, it's something that's only sort of suggested and the, the, the viewer has to fill in the blanks. And so if this text is giving 
a sort of interiority. Maybe it is, but it interior to whom? And to me, it seems like the text is not necessarily interested in giving an interiority to the subject of the photograph, but rather somebody else. And I'm not sure if it's the writers, like the people who made the book, or if it's the reader or what, but there is something there to that. Does that, does that resonate with you at all? It does, though I would, I mean, if we really wanted to get philosophical, I would say that writing doesn't do the interior either, that there's the mystery still of naked, of, of naked, of negative capability, that the words sort of in the best writing create the container for the negative space for the interiority to be filled by the reader. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, language is different from experience for sure. Um, and it begins, and language also weirdly begins as, I mean, written language begins as image too. <laughs> That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. And, yeah. and and I mean, of course, before phonetic language, it was pictorial and also had semantic significance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To to go back to this to the very beginning and to this idea of like the human archipelago and the connection of humans across our islands, especially now that people are in mass migration due to all sorts of causes from one space to another and being welcomed or rejected to varying degrees. One of the, you, you had mentioned how like stripping away at the beginning, the context sort of emphasizes the sameness between people. But I, I wonder if it's not sameness but if it's inviting us to make connections between things and then I, and that's where i almost feel like paradoxically the stripping away of context and then giving it back might allow us to make connections between things that we might not otherwise make connections between let's say between a japanese and internment camp a somali refugee camp and uh the ruins of a palestinian village and maybe like a uranium strip mine in a Native American reservation, all of which in the distant photographs might feel um, they have a kindred aesthetic as images, but politically maybe we hadn't thought about how they might actually have connections on the roots of their causes. I mean, he, uh, Cole's text does a lot of work to understand things like nationality and citizenship and prison camps and torture as all aspects of one thing, a, a sort of imperialist totalitarian paradigm. And so especially with the aerial landscapes, that's something that seems very conscious in the comparison, right? Yeah. But I think what's interesting to me, the portraits, compositionally very similar, many of them. And because we lack context, there is a sort of I think that on one level, we are invited to see, to note the similarities between the different portraits, right? But we are also invited, you can't help but because the pictures are compositionally so similar, that also tends to make the viewer focus on what is different about them and look and find the differences, right? It's, it's almost like when you, when you, those, those puzzles you'd see in like a highlights magazine, spot the differences, you know, right? Yes. That you only see when you, when you bother to actually look closely at them. And, and that also seems like a project of, of the images in this book. And this idea of making connections, one of the things that I thought was so interesting about this, this idea of an archipelago, an archipelago being something that we understand as like a collection of individuals, right? But that the collection is something that is bigger than the individual to which the individuals belong, but also in which the individuals remain individuated. And I think the structure of this book does that a lot. Something that, that comes up over and over again in the book, in the text of the book, is talking about people in kind of three different ways. First, people as individuals, like as we understand, you know, he will write about the sort of atrocities that this one specific person has uh, suffered, um, this one particular migrant, um, and that happens throughout the book. He also talks about people in pairs, whether that's parent and child or perhaps lovers. And then he also talks about people in communities, larger communities. 
And I think that there is this, the ways that the photographs, not just the photographs, but the photographs themselves, the photographs with text, and then the book as a whole functions, it replicates that. Because as I mentioned, almost all of the photographs are of just one person. And he is inviting us explicitly at the beginning of the book to understand that the images are not just individual images. They are part of a series, right? So if you took any of these single person portraits by itself, it would just be a picture of a person. And we would be trying to in understand the portrait as, especially because we understand photography to be the thing that it is of, like so many people understand photography to be no difference between the subject and the photograph. But we're trying to understand this person as an individual by sort of amassing a collection of individual people. There, for most of the book, you you can only see one image at a time. Uh, you know, in in a few parts we 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 have facing images, but for most of the book, we only see one person at a time. So the person remains an individual, but is also part of this collection that happens yes. throughout. Yeah, no, that's that's really well said. Also, right, you have the image and the text. Usually, it's the image on the right and the text on the left, and those are facing each other. So when you open, this is something that I think you know the the form of the codex. One of the things that it does is because it has facing pages like this, it invites you to understand the things that you're looking at on facing pages as being part of a pair. Um, so there's that pair thing happening. And whether that's two images or an image and white space or text and white space or text and text, I'm not sure that actually happens, but text and uh, image, there's pairs and there's a one-to-one -one relationship that is being shown there. And then if you take the collection as a whole, then you can expand out. And so the way that that structure of the book reflects this sort of tiered understanding of human relationship, I thought was just, I actually really thought it was brilliant. I, I thought it was very yeah. well done. Yeah, no, I love, I love your comment that it's preserving the individual, individuated islands of the archipelago, of the human archipelago, while also connecting us to the things that we share. Yeah. And the only other thing that I wanted to sort of touch on with this is, is sort of the rhythm of the book and of the layout of the book, because, and this is something that I think about a lot with my own books too, is, is the rhythm of this. That's something that photographers think about a lot um, when they're creating a book or perhaps an exhibition. What's the flow of it? And we're set up with this you know, text on the left, image on the right sort of paradigm in the beginning of the book. But from time to time that gets interrupted where maybe there will just be, um, we'll have that for a while. And then there will just be one block of text with no image. Then for, uh, we go back to the left, right, left, right. And then for a while, we just have a bunch of images in a, in, in a row. And then we go back to left, right, left, right. Then we, so that when you have like a long run of images or late in the book, there's a long run of text it really interrupts the flow of things in a way that makes you pay attention to it. And the way that that is, it's very photographic to me, the way that that interrupts the way that you interface with the text and the images, but especially with the text. You know what I mean? It's very yeah. musical. No, I, I hadn't, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm sure when reading it, I noticed when that happened, but I'm glad you pointed it out because I didn't note to I mean, I, I felt like it felt very naturally done at the same time as it was an interruption, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's almost like underlining, like, okay, now I'm just giving you text. In particular, one of the places where that happens, so I think two thirds to three quarters of the way through the book, is there's this, this, this run of maybe four or five pages with no images at all. And you notice that when it happens. And one of the, it's so interesting because that's the part where he's talking about torture and He's describing torture and describing the effects of torture on the tortured and the torturer. And yet there are no images. This is never depicted in a, in a visual way. And I think in some ways, like this actually makes it hit harder. The fact that you can't see what he's talking about. I think so too. And that's done so powerfully through the, just the layout of the book, I, I, the way that the rhythm of it can act as a sort of underlining or italicizing of the concept is, is, is very potent, I thought. Well, I was wondering, both thinking about how you said 
that most of the images are of one person. And also now this conversation about the rhythm or the musicality of, of the choices of, of how this book is put together in the order of things. If you would mind if I read the last text that goes with the last landscape image and then the last text that goes with the last portrait, which perhaps interestingly is of two people rather than one person. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So the last image we have that is not of people, it's hard to tell what you're looking at, but it looks to me on first glance like you're looking at a uh, blurry uh, shadow of a tree, perhaps. I don't know what it looks like to you. That's how I read it too, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's called Night Walking in Benares, India, and Benares or Varanasi is the place famous for the cremation pyres. People will go there in their last days to die and to be cremated at the Ganges because the, of the idea that you can experience moksha. You can be released from the circle of, of death and rebirth if, you're, if you die in Varanasi. And the text here, none of which is on this page, and when you see this page, you don't know that you're looking at an image in India, but this is an image presumably of someone who's walking along the Ganges in Benares. All the landscapes we crossed to get here, all the trees and streams and roads seen for the last time. The only thing you can really take with you is the hope that arriving, someone will recognize something in you and recognizing embrace you. Then we we turn the page and we, we come to the last portrait, which is of two men. And uh, you learn if you flip to the back that it's two unaccompanied minors in a Sudanese refugee camp in Kenya. And that section says, this is in quotes, so this is not probably Teju Cole. There are no strangers. There are only versions of ourselves many of which we have not embraced, most of which we wish to protect ourselves from. For the stranger is not foreign, she is random, not alien, but remembered. And it is the randomness of the encounter with our already known, though unacknowledged, selves that summons a ripple of alarm. And that's Toni Morrison from The Origin of Others. Then the final line which I think sort of captures, which is not Toni Morrison, but the final line of the book. There are no refugees, only fellow citizens whose rights we have failed to acknowledge. Yeah. I, I found it really uh, interesting, or not interesting is the wrong word, but really right that the book, which does utilize imagery so much, ends with just this what two sentence two line block of text with no image and also the text is on the right hand side where the image usually is in the, oh, in the right. book yeah you know i talked before about what does text do and what does image do and we think of and what i said before actually was that the image provides something more concrete but this last little bit and really this last sequence kind of shows exactly the opposite of that. Because I feel like the whole book is leading to this last line. It's leading to this statement of purpose that you are given in, in this last line. But you can't just come out and say that at the beginning of the book because it wouldn't land the same way. Right. So if image gives you something concrete in terms of place or appearance or surface, things like that, or, you know, time, uh, things like that, that text has a difficult time doing. Um, and what I talked about before, text giving you a, a certain interiority or philosophical context. But what image can't do, and this is such a smart way to end the book with this understanding, what image cannot do is give you a concrete and direct explanation of anything. Image can never, ever do that. In my own work, what I have found is 
that a lot of times I will want to make pictures in order to explicate something about my internal states. I want to make an image because I want, I mean, ultimately my, my photographic work and much of my written work is about making a connection between me and the audience that I want to give the audience the ability, the opportunity to understand me and who I am and how I think and feel and see. And I could tell people that, like, why don't I write, just write an essay about it, right? I could tell right. people what I'm thinking, but instead what I'm doing is, you know, that, that, that only gives you a certain sort of surface ex understanding of it, right? What I'm trying to do is come at it at an angle where by coming at it obliquely and making the reader or the viewer do the work of inhabiting my existence. That's not something that the image can do itself. It requires the reader to do the work. And I feel like that is exactly what this book is doing because the images kind of are what they are and images can only ever suggest an understanding. And because the text for so much of the book is oblique, it's requiring you as the reader to do this work, to meet it where it is, right? And only then at the end, can it make the statement that this is what I've been trying to tell you. And by the time you get there, you as the reader are also already there. And I just thought that was such a strong use of the form, such a brilliant um, way to cap it all off. Um, and really, you know, as a message makes it effective, but also just as a piece of craft, utilizing the strengths of both mediums so well. It's just so well done. Well, I would agree with everything you just said, and you said it better than I ever could, but I want to add something that you may or may not agree with. But um, <laughs> I do agree that the more work you put into it or the more times you engage with the book, kind of like a poem, because of the associative nature of, a, of poetry, the more you'll get out of the experience. And I do feel like the book invites us to do that. But I also feel a little hesitant to call it work because strangely, I guess one of the magic tricks, not because it isn't work, but one of the magic tricks of this book, I think, is its subject matter is very, the scope of the subject matter is, is huge and overwhelming. And they, they, as we talked about, bring it down to a scale, you know, meeting people's eyes, small blocks of text that allows us in. But somehow, despite the work that the book and the repetition the book might suggest we do, and somehow despite the subject matter, the book is, is a, it's a joy to read. It, the aesthetically pleasurable book to read, but also somehow a book of, of the possibilities of connection. Yeah. Yeah. At least for me. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I think that's, that's a, that's a pretty good, uh, way to sum up the experience, I think. And maybe yeah. not a terrible place for us to end our conversation. But, um, thank you so much for talking with me, David. I really enjoyed our conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I do too. Is that a, is that a plane? It is. Okay. So it's a plane suggesting the ways we can connect island to island. <laughs> from our various from our various pandemic bum bunkers across the world we can remember in memory the the flights and take flights of imagination going forward <laughs> how about that how about that i you know what i i usually would try to filter that out but maybe i'll leave it in this time <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not that's up to you I had so much fun. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. I'm, it was such an honor to be one of your first um, guests for this new uh, book club conversation project you're you're embarking on. All right. As I mentioned at the top of the show, there is a link in the show notes to where you can buy a copy of Human Archipelago via Bookshop.org. I also do recommend seeing if you can order it through your local independent bookstore. There's also a link to David Neiman's podcast, Between the Covers, which, as always, I highly recommend. And if you'd like to support David's work, go to patreon.com slash between the covers and make a per episode pledge to his campaign there. I've been a patron of his show for a couple of years now, and I have always been so happy to be able to do so. Once again, that's patreon.com slash between the covers. And that is our show. 
Editing and mixing on this episode is by me. The music is by Poddington Bear. And transcription help on this episode is by Shea Aguinaldo. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please do tell a friend to help spread the word. You know, a personal recommendation goes a long way with podcasts. And I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com or find me on Twitter at channelopenpod. Let me know what you thought of Human Archipelago, what you thought of our conversation today, or what you thought about the last book you read. And as always, you can find all the rest of the show's social media information, email newsletter, show notes, and transcripts at keepthechannelopen.com. Next week, I'm pleased to be welcoming poet Maggie Smith back to the show, and we'll be discussing her new book of essays, Keep Moving. That will be coming on October 7th, so stay tuned for that. And until then, remember, keep the channel open. (laughs) 